much. Um, thank you so much for joining our uh, Exxon Mobile ISPL Response Knowledge Transfer Webinar. This is our webinar 20th. And this is also our uh, first talk on the oil in the C4 series. And today uh, we have uh, three speakers. Uh, John, Dr. John Farrington is Dean Emeritus at the Woods Hall. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Scott, uh, Scott Zoglowski from Texas A&M, uh, Dr. Barry Tenso from Florida International Universities. And they will talk about the oil chemistry and fate of oil in the sea. Uh, so I would like them to introduce themselves in a minute. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, first, I'm going to briefly introduce our uh, webinar format. Uh, so the our webinar is a one monthly webinar series. So uh, we held the webinar every first Tuesday of the month uh, from 10 to 11.15 a.m. U.S. Houston time. And we'll give uh, speakers an hour to talk. Um, and about 15 to 20 minutes for questions. So the questions can only be typed in through a Q&A button. And at the end of the talk, we'll go through all the questions all together. Uh, we, we are also going to record uh, both audio and video uh, of the whole webinar, including the questions. Um, so if anybody don't like to pronounce their names uh, during the call, you can send out the questions anonymously. Uh, I also put the recording link um, in the meeting invite. Uh, we put uh, all the record, all the past recordings in the API, uh, API website, and the link is in the meeting invite. Um, we are going to keep uploading the recordings, uh, the past recordings when they are ready. Um, I think that's all I need to mention. I will give the floor to uh, Dr. Tenso. Thank you, Lynn. Um, hello. Welcome to the webinar on the face of oil in the sea. During this webinar, we will present some of the topics discussed in Chapter 5 of Oil in the Sea 4, Inputs, Fates, and Effects. Three of us, as the members of the Ad Hoc Committee on Oil in the C4, will summarize processes and advancements made during the last two decades on the fate of oil in the sea. Uh, Dr. John Farrington, Dean Emeritus at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, with expertise in marine chemistry, biochemistry of organic chemicals of environmental concern and interaction between science and policy, Dr. Scott Sokolowski, professor in the Zachary Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Texas A&M University, with expertise in <clears throat> oil spill modeling, <clears throat> marine natural seeps, and physical chemical characteristics of oil, and myself, Baron Tansel, professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Florida International University, with expertise in oil water emulsions, weathering of crude and refined oils, partitioning and persistence, and mobility of oil in different forms. In the fall 2020, uh, a committee of 17 members was convened for a consensus study uh, titled Oil in the C4, Inputs, Fates, and Effects. The study was sponsored by uh, American Petroleum Institute, I'm sorry, uh, Bureau of Oceanographic, uh, sorry, let me go to the second slide. I went too fast. Uh, the study was sponsored by the American Petroleum Institute, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, uh, Bureau of Safety and en Environmental Enforcement, Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, National Academy of uh, Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, President's Circle Fund, Oceans and Fisheries Canada, 17 member committee uh, had monthly meetings uh, in, with input from committee expertise, scientific literature, and 55, 58 invited speakers and three consultant teams. And the report was reviewed by additional 13 experts. 
Let me go to the earlier slide. Throughout the years, national academies have conducted consensus studies on inputs, fates, and effects of petroleum-based hydrocarbon mixtures in the sea, leading to a series of reports in 1975, 1985, and 2003, and the last report being the oil industry in the sea four in 2022. Nearly two decades have passed since the third report was released, and since then there has been significant advancements both in research and knowledge due to major spills occurring in the ocean environment. So in this uh, webinar, we will highlight some of these advancements uh, that had happened in the last 20 years. The committee members had wide range of experience and included Kersitika as the chair, Ed Levine as vice chair, Aqua Asa Awoki, uh, CJ Beagle Kraus, Victoria Brohe, Steve Bushank, Doug Marshmit Etkin, John Farrington, Julia Foote, Bernie Goldstein, Karis Mitchell Moore, Nancy Rabalai, Jeff Short, Scott Sokolowski, Baron Tensel, Helen White, and Michael Zicardi. Uh, the statement of task aligns with the narrative uh, how oil interacts with the sea. And as the committee worked, we worked on different chapters in, in smaller teams or at, at large uh, at the entire committee. Chapter two discusses what oil is, incorporating some important advancements in analytical chemistry, as well as models to predict oil behavior. Chapter three focuses on where the oil is coming from and the quantities of oil input into the sea. Chapter four discusses accidental spill mitigation measures. Chapter five that we will summarize today focuses on what happens to the oil once it reaches the sea assimilating significant advancements in understanding of transport and fate of oil in the sea. Chapter six, which will be the subject of next webinar, discusses the harm oil can have on the marine environment and marine organisms and the effects of oil on both the ecosystem and humans. Chapter five, uh, which we are summarizing uh, today uh, on fates, uh, discusses many of the advances, new knowledge, new techniques that have been developed and used since Oil in the Sea 3 report was released. Once oil enters the marine environment, its chemical composition, physical properties, and behavior immediately begins to change due to combinations of dynamic processes that ultimately determine the fate of its components over time. This chapter presents the various combinations of processes that dominate in different circumstances and locations in the marine ecosystem. Fundamental transport and weathering processes that were discussed, are discussed in this uh, chapter include transport and dilution, routes to and from atmosphere, photochemical reactions, dissolution, emulsification, microbial degradation, and also this chapter uh, discusses oil spill budgets with some examples from uh, past spills. The chapter oil fates in specific environments in view of episodic and chronic inputs uh, also discussed in this chapter. The episodic inputs uh, goes into detail of fate of oil in view of the processes on sea surface in the water column deep sea and sediments, shorelines and near shore sediments, as well as Arctic marine systems and sea ice uh, uh, in detail. For chronic inputs, the discussion includes fate of oil from natural seeps, offshore produced water discharges, ship discharges, riverine sources, sediments and bywalls, This chapter also includes modeling of the transport and fate of spilled oil. As you can see, it's a very extensive, very big chapter in the document. An important aspect of the committee's work was to compile and highlight the major advances in the past 20 years in understanding oil behavior and fate in the sea. Significant progress has been made in understanding interactions of oil, live oil, 
and gas spilled within the ocean water column. Predicting gas bubble sizes and oil droplet breakup processes critical to determining their fate and ultimately the affected environments. Data storage platforms and computing capabilities have advanced so much that we are now uh, able to model in detail uh, oil spills in the ocean using computational fluid dynamics uh, methodologies more in depth. Photooxidation by solar irradiation of oil at the sea surface and near surface, we have new insight uh, that John will touch upon. And high throughput DNA sequencing, bioinformatics software, and sequence databases, which are referred as omics, have advanced the ability to detect and analyze microbial communities. These are discussed in detail uh, in, in this chapter. In addition, terminology used to describe microscopic and macroscopic aggregates of oil within mineral and organic particles in the sea and stranded on shore has been refined. The report addresses in detail the terminology and confusing terms that have been used in literature among responders uh, that were gener generically referred as uh, oily particles or tarballs. Uh, next, Scott will summarize some of the processes that affect fate of oil and advancements made in recent years. Scott, we can't hear you. Sorry, thank you. Um, thank you, Baron. So uh, continuing still with some of the highlights that are listed at the beginning of the chapter and then expanded in more detail within the chapter, the Deepwater Horizon, of course, was a major incident that happened about halfway between oil in the C3 and the oil in C4 report. And we note that a huge amount of data was collected during the spill and a large amount of research was done following the spill, both utilizing that data, conducting new experiments and building new models. Uh, subsurface dispersant injection was used also for the first time in a major way to respond to a, a major marine underwater blowout. Uh, MOSFA is uh, an acronym coined uh, through some of the research following Deepwater Horizon, which stands for Marine Oil Snow Sedimentation and Flocculent Accumulation, and was a phenomenon that was observed in the Gulf of Mexico and used to explain some of the vertical transport of oil from the sea surface down to the sea floor or also through the water column through the settling of marine snow. Uh, as I already mentioned, dispersant injection and the modeling of gas oil mixtures at depth and the oil plumes that happened during Deepwater Horizon were studied a lot recently. We've also developed sophisticated tracking, monitoring, and forensic identification methods for spilled oil over the last 20 years. Uh, marine oil spill research in the realm of big data, Barron's already mentioned, like the computing power and the omics databases, and now moving into more uh, of a culture of publicly um, repository data that then can be interrogated by all kinds of people. Um, Formation and transport of oil mineral ag aggregates, which links back also to the discussion where Baron was mentioning that uh, the terminology that's been used through literature has been sometimes confusing and is and also a lot of new research has been done in that particular area. And we we summarize that and it, a new recognition through the observations, both during Deepwater Horizon and then also in the Arctic, especially that oil bi biodegradation can occur at faster rates than previously assumed in near freezing temperatures. So, so next slide, thanks. So as uh, Baron mentioned, the layout of the chapter starts with a discussion of the general processes that oil might undergo in its interaction with the sea, independent of how it is spilled. Um, these processes are highlighted in this drawing on the right hand side and include the formation of bubbles and droplets after the spill of oil since oil is immiscible in water the mixing dispersion and dilution of that oil as it is transported through the ocean water column uh, possible dissolution of the soluble components present in the oil and gas that might be released 
emulsification, the mixing of oil and water together to form a stable or quasi-stable mixture. Surface spreading, once the oil reaches the surface, there are several different spreading processes depending on the thickness and the properties of the oil. Evaporation as it interacts with the atmosphere, as well as aerosolization as uh, surface roughness, turbulence, and waves interact with oil droplet penetration in the atmosphere. And biodegradation throughout all compartments of this sketch um, involving different forms of oil and different organisms. Sorption and entrainment to marine snow and other particles present in the ocean, oil particle interactions. Um, and especially the, the first item, the bubble and droplet formation, new models to predict what sizes to expect. And then submergence, different ways that oil that reaches the surface may then penetrate the surface through wave breaking or through other processes such as the MOSFA event and then subsequent sinking uh, to the ocean. So now talking about some of the fundamental processes in more detail, uh, and we can't cover them in enough detail in this talk, but um, the recognition from Deepwater Horizon that live oil may be spilled into the ocean and live gas, this just is a term used to describe oil and gas that are not in equilibrium at atmospheric temperature and pressure, but rather at some other pressure, such as the reservoir pressure, where perhaps all of what we call the gaseous comments, components could be dissolved in the liquid phase of the oil, or some fraction of those gaseous components could be dissolved in the liquid phase, and all of the volatiles may still be in the liquid phase or present in the gas phase. So this live oil could be released in the ocean as it was during Deepwater Horizon, um, and then dissolution of those components may be much more uh, pronounced than, say, for a surface spill of a tanker oil that has relatively low soluble compounds because it's already come to equilibrium with the atmosphere and the lights have been um, distilled in other for other processes. So dead oil refers to oil in its um, basically production state after separation uh, when liquid oil and gas are in equilibrium with their headspace at atmospheric temperature and pressure. And then weathering is a term that entered the oil spill literature many decades ago and refers to any process that changes the composition of oil after its release. It's called weathering typically because we initially were looking at oil slicks that interact with the atmosphere and therefore weather, actual weather. But in the case of the Deepwater Horizon, it was subsurface for a while before it surfaced. Um, and the dissolution processes are still typically referred to in the literature as weathering. So we chose to use that term the way it's used in the literature in this chapter. Next slide. So some of the immiscible dynamics, how oil and gas form sheens and slicks and bubbles and droplets um, on the surface. These can spread out into very thin uh, micron thickness uh, slicks as well as much thicker uh, weathered oil and, and then emulsified oil um, all floating near the surface. Then as the oil interacts with seawater and mixes with seawater because it's immiscible, then bubbles and droplets will form. And their sizes are very important because they control the transport in the water column. Different sized droplets will rise at a different velocity. And then because the ocean currents are transporting these droplets or bubbles laterally as they rise, then these different sizes will end up in different locations. Whoa. There we go. Yep. There we are. Um, go back just a second. Yep. So generally the breakup of oil and gas into droplets and bubbles subsea will happen due to turbulent fluctuations and just the mixing of the ocean water with the bubbles and gas and droplets until the bubble size and the droplet size is at equilibrium with the forces that are able to break it up. And then you can't make smaller droplets after that. Next slide. So on the surface, there are many processes that uh, give rise to spreading and different flick slick 
thicknesses and then weathering processes that then change the properties of oil. Um, the chapter goes into some of that detail. I think a lot of this was known very well in the past as well. So there's less of a focus in this chapter on some of these processes. Um, I do highlight that SAR imagery and highlight and um, satellite methods to observe oil in the sea have matured a lot in the last couple of decades um, and can be used to find natural seeps in the ocean as well as accidental or unreported releases. Um, and NOAA now has a product where they are interrogating the SAR imagery and putting out reports that highlight areas of potential oil based on the reflectivity of that kind of radar that they observe different slicks. Um, there is a section in the chapter that deals specifically with the atmosphere and the atmosphere's uh, contribution to oil in the sea through transport from terrestrial releases, uh, say, for example, from uh, combustion as well as other processes, as well as transport of oil from the ocean into the atmosphere through the uh, the, we're just thinking of uh, aerosol production. Um, and there's not a lot of data on the amount, but this is for the other chapter of the inputs, but then we that then leads to some uncertainty about the amount of oil and its properties as it enters into the ocean. Um, the processes on the ocean side that give rise to the release of oil into the atmosphere mostly have to do with the bubble and bubble breaking at the surface as well as droplet breaking due to breaking waves or to surface roughness on the ocean, as well as combustion of oil. If you are uh, burning an oil as part of the response strategy that can emit black carbon and soot into the atmosphere. Next slide. So just a little more about bubble breakup and droplet breakup. Um, since Deepwater Horizon, several new models have been developed to predict droplet sizes. Again, droplet sizes are key because they set the surface area of the droplet, which determines the amount of dissolution. They set the rise velocity, which determines the residence time. And then those two things together determine what goes into the ocean and where. So the droplet size has always been known to be a key uh, element of oil transport in the ocean. Um, through Deepwater Horizon and some of the subsequent experiments, we recognize that interfacial tension, which is the force per unit length along the surface of a bubble or droplet, uh, is important to hold the droplet together. But then when we add dispersants, which reduce the interfacial tension and droplets get smaller, eventually the viscosity itself of the oil is able to hold the oil together into a droplet. So some new models are now able to take into account this transition from interfacial tension dominated to viscosity dominated breakup. And one reason it's so difficult to, produce, to predict bubble and droplet size is that it's basically the turbulent motion in the water that is ripping the droplets or bubbles apart. And turbulence itself is not a property of the fluid. It's a property of the flow field. And so every flow motion, whether it's breaking waves, ocean currents, oil and jets, jets of oil and gas being jetted into the ocean through, through um, accidental releases. All of these have different fluid dynamics, different turbulence, therefore will have different bubble droplet and breakup sizes. And this figure on the right, it's just highlighting also that the experiments that have been done, which are these circles, dots, and other symbols, are in a different part of the dimensional space than the accidents that have occurred, which is this gray bar on the right-hand side of the deep water horizon. So when we try to predict the behavior in the ocean, we unfortunately have to extrapolate beyond um, what we've measured in the laboratory in terms of non-dimensional space. Okay, and I'll turn it back. Is it now, John? I, I don't have, a, I forget, is John's next? Yes, I am, Scott, and thank you All very right. much. All right, thank you, John. <clears throat> May I have the next slide, please? Photochemical reactions. 
there's been a uh, significant advance over several decades in our understanding of the role of photochemical reactions in the fate of spilled oil. In a sense, they were considered early in the uh, 70s, and then they sort of fell off the table, if I could use that terminology, uh, as other things came to the fore. And during the last two decades, there's been a renewed appreciation of the photochemical reaction, and it's resulted in a paradigm shift causing us to consider photochemical reactions as one of the major factors influencing the fate of spilled oil at the sea surface and also on the shoreline as it comes ashore. The paradigm shift is indicated in the upper right-hand corner here where prior to about 2018, that was the current paradigm of the impact of photochemical fate on spilled oil, and especially the deep water horizon surface oil. As research progressed, we evolved in our knowledge to the revised paradigm uh, given below, where we've moved from things happening sort of in the longer term, day, week, month, but not a whole lot, to something significant starting uh, almost immediately as the sunlight uh, as the oil interacts with sunlight at the surface. There are at least three processes that we now know. Let's, let's back up there. Or have the potential to occur during photochemical reactions of oil. And this is based on field observations as well as experimentation in the laboratory. We have direct or indirect photooxidation. So if you look at the lower right-hand corner uh, diagram, direct photooxidation involves sunlight interacting directly with the oil compounds themselves. Indirect photooxidation is the sunlight interacting with other chemicals and particularly producing reactive oxygen species, which then interact with the components in the oil yielding products. Not only do we have photooxidation, but we also have photoinduced polymerization. That means sunlight interacting with oil or oil photochemical products creating polymers. In the reverse process, there is also photocracking of larger molecules where sunlight interacts with larger polymers or larger molecular weight molecules and breaks it up. The way to think about this is by extension from natural organic compounds, a reasonable assumption is that some of the photooxidation reaction products are susceptible to microbial degradation. Likewise, there can be uptake and metabolism of these reaction products by at least some multicellular marine organisms. May I have the next slide, please? Let's turn now to a topic which I will say nearly overwhelmed our committee in some respects in terms of the amount of literature and the new knowledge that came about. Fortunately, our colleague, uh, Professor Julia Folk, uh, was with us, uh, has a tremendous expertise in uh, microbial processes related to oil in the sea. Unfortunately, she couldn't join us. I'll try to do the best I can to cover the highlights. Uh, but first, let me say, the issue that Baron mentioned before, omics techniques. Uh, this is just a, it has resulted in a huge advance in our understanding of what's going on with microbial community and oil in the sea. In fact, in our, even though we have an extensive section of the chapter four on microbial community and omics techniques, uh, it became clear that we had to shift a lot of discussion of the actual definition of omics uh, to an appendix. And so there's an appendix in the report that covers the details. We have high throughput, next generation sequencing and other analytical technologies used to describe the evolutionary relationships. Uh, you have sequence selected marker genes. You have sequencing of total DNA, the genome of a single species. 
you have sequencing of the total DNA of a microbial community. Isolating and sequencing total messenger RNA from a species. Let me just say that these are all indicated in a simplified diagram on the right, even though it appears complicated to us as we look at it. I think it's fair to say that omics techniques, uh, something that has evolved from fundamental research in microbiology and molecular biology, was applied initially to understanding fundamental microbial processes in the marine environment, and then was available to us to take a look at oil spills. So as an example of how fundamental research underpins the issue of what we do with respect to understanding the fate of oil in the marine environment. It's just one example. It occurs in a lot of places. We have microbial interactions with oil in the marine food web. Uh, it always amazes me when I look at this, but the world's oceans have an estimate to contain 10 to the 29th microbial cells, perhaps exceeding the number of stars in the universe 100,000 fold. I have to say as an aside that that was before some of the latest uh, uh, telescope <laughs> information that came available, but you get the message. <laughs> There's a lot of microbial cells. There's a certain ubiquitous microbes, particularly bacteria, that can degrade specific petroleum compounds, using them as high energy substrates for growth. I've already touched upon the advances of DNA sequencing with accompanying software technologies. Biodegradation leaves behind some of the high molecular weight components, such as large polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, resins, and asphaltines plus unaltered whole oil that is not bioavailable. Now, this is an important point, which we'll come to in, in just a minute. The microbes have to have access to the oil. And that's one of the issues uh, that's involved in this rather uh, complicated but uh, interesting diagram on the right, which I encourage you to study in more detail uh, in the recording. Some of the reaction product intermediates, we back up, <clears throat> back up just a bit. One slide back, please. Some of the reaction products can combine with other organic molecules in the environment to form biogeopolymers that are then less susceptible to further biodegradation. And we know that microbes may mineralize from 10% to 90% of the oil mass, depending on the oils chemical composition and environmental conditions. Next slide. Scott has already mentioned the issue of marine oil snow and marine oil snow sedimentation and flocculent accumulation, MOSFA. Marine oil snow forms when naturally or chemically dispersed oil droplets are attached to marine snow and mineral particles. Well, people often ask, what is marine snow? It's a description of flocculent particulate material in the water column. Uh, among the first to observe it was William Beebe in a dive in the bathyscaphe off of uh, Bermuda several decades ago. And he conveyed it to his colleague, uh, Rachel Carson, who incorporated a description of these particles floating around in the water column in her book. And let me just say that marine oil snow particles are microhabitats of about 0.5 millimeters in size, rich in organic matter, and they can form via two general mechanisms, preformed aggregates interacting with oil or oil acting as a nucleus for microbial biofilm growth and flock formulation. The large scale and transient role of marine oil snow, flocculent accumulation phenomena observed during a deep water horizon spill is difficult to ascertain in situ or even in controlled laboratory studies. It's much more research that needs to be done. Occurrence of MOSFA events have been reported at different geographical locations 
before the Deepwater Horizon spill, although not by that acronym. And there's a lot of arguments that go back and forth about this. Let me just say for those who aren't familiar with marine, with oil, marine snow, and say, well, does marine snow actually exist? I'll give you a personal comment on this. During my only dive in the Alvin to 1800 meters off the Northeast Continental Slope, going through the water column, through the euphotic zone, into the twilight zone, I observed marine snow particulates in the water column. And others who've done that sort of thing and, do and dove down to those depths have observed it as well. Whether that interacts with all types of oil and into the marine environment is something that, that is yet to be determined. Nonetheless, the whole business of MOSFA has given rise to the question, how do we define particulate materials that interact with oil and oil particles? And I turn it over to Baron for that. Thank you, John. Um, now, since the uh, last report, Oil in the C3, we have uh, a flux of new terminology defining particles and uh, the terminology for aggregates that form after oil spills, including marine snow, oil snow, uh, in water column and in the sediments now have descriptive terminology. Generic terminology such as aggregates, tar mats, or pools have been refined. More specific and descriptive terminology have been introduced in view of differences in composition, size of particles, and where it forms in the marine environment, whether it is in the water column or in the sediments. These descriptive terminology include oil mineral aggregates, which are aggregates that are mixed mix, mixtures of oil and minerals. These are less dense than mineral oily, mineral only aggregates. Mineral only aggregates are denser, they settle faster. Oil sediment aggregates, uh, smaller aggregates associated with sediments, oil particle aggregates that form from mineral and organic particles. And these are generally particles associated with marine oil snow. Until uh, deep water horizon oil spill, sediment oil aggregates were considered under the broad category of tar bowls and were referred as tar mats. After the deep water horizon spill, the terms uh, such as surface residual bowl and submerged oil mat were introduced to describe, to better describe these agglomerates. The terms surface residual bowls surface residual patties and sediment oil mats are almost exclusively used to describe those that formed after deep water horizon residuals. The, uh, the report, Oil in the C4 report, has actually specific terminology that goes more in, in depth into these definitions and how they had been used in the literature. There has also been significant research to understand and verify fate of oil in coastal areas and shorelines. Some of these uh, information or knowledge are not new, but they have been verified and quantified. The persistence and character of stranded oil on coarse sediment beaches, uh, and also oil uh, buried in sand and gravel beaches that remain stranded uh, for a while. Also in salt and brackish water marshes, what happens there? And oil usually adheres to the intertidal vegetation and especially light oils can penetrate and persist in the sediments. At shorelines with mangroves, uh, which had been affected in the recent spills, oil can be trapped in the root zone, adhere to the roots and penetrate into the sediments. And washover events occurring dur during storm surges uh, high tides, tropical storms, and hurricanes can mobilize and deposit sand. Some of these uh, facts, although known for a while through observations, field observations, they have been quantified and verified. 
In addition, the process of mapping coastal environments and ranking their relative sensitivity has been expanded and refined. Environmental Sensitivity Index, often referred as ESI maps, used for oil spill contingency planning now include detailed information built into the geographic information system, the GIS database, to provide a visual summary of the coastal resources that are at risk, such as birds, shellfish beds, coral reefs, public beaches, parks, and others. The shoreline cleanup assessment technique, referred as SCAT, has been also refined and expanded to include a wider range of shoreline types and coastal processes that affect oil behavior. Determining and recommending appropriate cleanup methods and placing constraints on cleanup efforts, if necessary, now include considerations for ecological, economic, and cultural concerns. Next, Scott, you again. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, this uh, figure on the right-hand side actually is pretty similar to one that was in Oil in the C3 um, as oil companies were working to move into deeper water in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, a JIP um, led by the Minerals Management Service at the time did some laboratory experiments into what could happen with an undersea blowout. In 2010, we know uh, we did have the Deepwater Horizon accident, and a lot has been learned since then and has been able to verify uh, some of the predictions from laboratory experiments and things that we thought could happen. So um, this last bullet here, two main consequences that are important, is kind of what helps to summarize what's happening in this figure, and that's that the oil droplets and the gas bubbles formed when you release oil into the ocean um, have their own vertical rise velocity and they don't mix into seawater the same way that smoke mixes into the atmosphere or wastewater discharged into the ocean would mix into the ocean. And that is a, a mixing of two miscible fluids. Once they mix together, they can't be unmixed. When you put the coffee and the cream in your cup, you can't get the cream back. But with oil and gas droplets, uh, oil droplets and gas bubbles, uh, you could get the oil slick back and they don't have to go where the water goes. So what we see in this figure, for example, the pure current is that you release oil and gas into the ocean, the lateral current pushes the plume over, and then the entrained seawater that goes with that dark black curve goes somewhere other than the gas bubbles and perhaps the oil droplets depending on their size. Um, likewise, the ocean water column is stratified. We have denser water in the bottom than we have at the top. And so as a plume of oil and gas rises through the ocean, it will be dragging denser bottom water up. Eventually, that bottom water cannot continue to rise and could fall down to form intrusions. And so during Deepwater Horizon, there's a very prominent layer of dissolved uh, petroleum compounds at about 1,100 meters in the ocean that extended for many kilometers away from the deep water horizon. So a lot of these dynamics have um, been refined and better well understood through data collected during deep water horizon and through models. I think I've covered those bullets. So the next slide. Um, so another area that has been studied a lot over the last couple of decades is what would happen to oil if it's released into the Arctic. And in this slide, this figure on the right, which is adapted from an NRC report from 2014, we see a lot of these interactions. So ice itself is known to harbor communities of, microbe, of microbes and viruses. And these can be distinct from those in seawater because of the way that ice forms with seawater ejecting the brine um, and then changing the salinity of the water in the ice as well as the salinity of the water in the melt ice around the ice uh, and the temperature. Bacterial metabolism has also been detected at temperatures as low as minus 20 degrees C, particularly and microbes physically associated with other cells, such as algae or inorganic particles. So whereas maybe we earlier thought that biodegradation would not be an important process in the Arctic, it may now be recognized that it certainly could be in certain environments. Um, 
then the seasonal solar irradiation uh, plays a large role. If you have a spill in the summer months in the Arctic, all of the photochemical processes that John was describing that might happen for 12 hours a day in the Gulf of Mexico could be happening for 20, 24, up to 24 hours a day in the Arctic. Whereas if it were to happen, if a spill happened in the winter months, then there may not be photo oxidation and the uh, weathering of the oil could be quite different. Also because of this so the seasonal pattern, we have different microbes, phytoplankton and cyanobacteria communities that might be blooming and not blooming in different seasonal months. So we can expect a lot of very Arctic specific processes to be happening in the, in the ice. At the same time, the transport of oil through the ice is extremely complicated. The, the oil will always be lighter. Well, not necessarily, but is generally lighter than the fresh water and the brine brackish water and uh, the ice. So it will try to make its way up through fissures and cracks in the ice. It could get frozen back into the ice um, and it can be dispersed underneath the ice once it becomes encapsulated in ice or, or, or stuck within some bottom roughness. It may then transport with the ice and move in a different direction than the ocean currents if the ice is being pushed a different way. So there are a lot of new processes to study. There have been a few experiments um, as well as uh, new technologies designed to observe and detect oil and ice. Uh, and there's a lot still to be done. I think I turn it back. Oh no, here's the third slide. I thought there were three, but then I was confused when I uh, kept thinking the Arctic slide was last, sorry. Okay, then this slide summarizes very briefly um, to two decades of development in oil fate and transport modeling. And what I wanna just highlight is that uh, over, the, over time, the simpler algorithms that are applied to models that um, are designed to, to model the entire spill, say from the source to the beach, uh, many algorithms to deal with these different fate and transport uh, mechanisms we've been discussing have been developed. Um, different tools to use the ocean current predictions that are now available online from different ocean current models. All of this has greatly advanced. But one area that is new since, say, 20 years ago is the application of CFD tools, computational fluid dynamics, to model oil spills. While these are probably not mature enough to be deployed during a response to, to direct responders, they are very helpful in the pre-spill stage to understand what could happen to design mitigation strategies. And um, the two big advances I think are in large eddy simulation, which is a type of modeling that captures some of the turbulent motions in the ocean. Uh, there are two new techniques that were developed that allow those models to be run at larger scale than previously. Not only the higher computing power that allows us to have more grid cells, but also the efficiency of the computer algorithms in their way of how they can treat the oil droplets and gas bubbles because they're so small. We need some model to predict their behavior within these com computational fluid dynamics models. Um, and so the development of those models has helped us to then run simulations of things like the Deepwater Horizon or other spills and then interrogate um, dynamics of like the fluid dynamics inside or very near the pipe of the deep water horizon or in the jet and plume that occurs above it. Um, but at the same time, those models necessarily have to simplify some of the fate process. Usually, usually they operate on a shorter time scale so that many of the fate processes may not yet be active, though dissolution probably is and droplet breakup and gas bubble formation definitely is. And those three processes have been recently incorporated into these high resolution computer models. But algorithms such as the, the longer term biodegradation and MOSPA formation interaction with particles and all these other processes that we have been talking about, many of them are not yet realized in many models and algorithms need to be developed that allow us to make those predictions because they do have an effect on the fate of oil in the sea. Thank you.
I think I turn it back to you, Baron. Is that right? I think the next will be John. Yeah. John. Oh, John. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Here. Thanks, Scott. So we'll just summarize here with a few key conclusions on the fates of oil in the sea. There were insights afforded by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Appreciation of the physics, uh, the dead oil versus live oil, as Scott has been pointing out, and I think we've now emphasized that three or four times. The effects of subsurface dispersion injection is something that required a great deal of attention and was something new. I should emphasize uh, that we uh, deferred in our report on many things related to dispersions to the previous uh, <clears throat> just a year or so ago, National Academy of Science, uh, Engineering and Medicine report on dispersant of oil in the marine environment. So we have several references to that and, and we encourage people to take a look at that in conjunction with our report. The importance of the oil and mineral aggregates uh, that Baron has talked about, the role of marine snow in transporting spilled oil to the seafloor, and the magnitude of oil degradation, biodegradation in cold, deep ocean water. Now, let me just point out that even though there were insights that were afforded by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, by no means did we just focus only on the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. We took into account uh, an amazing amount of literature that came to us from studies around the world, even though we were focused on just North American waters. Uh, and these were different types of oil spills under different kinds of conditions. And we had call outs uh, in the report uh, emphasizing certain aspects of, of specific spills. We've mentioned already the significance of photo oxidation of oil at or near the ocean surface has received renewed appreciation. Another issue that we spent some time uh, pointing out is that we're now faced with a big data management issue within the context of interdisciplinary research. We have a lot of information coming to us. For example, uh, three webinars or so ago, we talked about what is oil? and the composition of oil and the advances of analytical chemistry that can interact with all of the other disciplines looking at oil in the marine environment. In this presentation, we talked about omics in relation to the microbial processes. How do we get all that stuff and information together in a, a uh, data management situation that is uh, easily uh, put together uh, is taken care of and is easily accessible to those who need to take a look at it. Another point we raised is the issue of having adequate baseline knowledge and data ahead of time in key areas where you know you might have uh, a higher probability, even though the probability is low, a higher probability of oil spills. The issue is that we realize that baseline knowledge is not static. We are dealing with evolving baselines. Just think about uh, sea level rise in relation to uh, various situations in the coastal oceans of the world. Scott talked about the issue about Arctic studies and we emphasize there needs to be continuing investigation of uh, key issues related to oil spills in the Arctic. The whole question of laboratory and mesocosm experiments, field studies and modeling, and how do you effectively bring those together interactively? We also in the report emphasize the fact that if regulations could be modified slightly, it would be a good thing to be able to have experimental oil spills because despite all of the work and it's excellent work that's going on in laboratory and mesocosm experiments, field studies and modeling, there's nothing like dealing with the actual situation as we've learned in a number of oil spills and being prepared ahead of time 
to be ready to do that is key. Advances in microbial ecology is something that we talked about in great detail. We wrote uh, some really important recommendations along those lines. The whole issue of new fuel types as we go forward to the into the future. Being ready to deal with new fuel types, understanding their composition, understanding what the impacts might be, understanding what their physical dynamics might be, and how that all will contribute to issues associated with oil spill budget. And, and uh, Scott has mentioned some of the issues of oil spill budget shortcomings. Next slide, please. Next slide. And lastly, we had a number of recommendations on research needs, and I won't go into these in great detail. Uh, it's been a huge advance in our knowledge based on research that's been ongoing, both in the field and in the laboratories and in maze of cousins. We made some recommendations in all of the various categories that you might think of, physical mechanisms affecting the fate of oil, chemical reactions, including photochemistry, affecting the fates of oil, biological effects on the fates of oil, the fates of oil in remote sites, such as in the Arctic or in the deep waters, fates of oil and behavior and fates of new or unconventional oils, for example, low sulfur fuels and uh, various aspects of uh, diluted bitumen. And then there's the whole issue, as Scott has pointed out eloquently, refining models of oil behavior and fate. Keep in mind that continuing research under my, under, yeah, under my, that's correct. Continuing research underpins continued advance on the understanding of the fates of oil in the sea. And I think we've demonstrated that rather nicely in the report and the write-up and the references provided therein. Next slide. Thank you very much for your attention on the behalf of the three of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, all three for you give a, a great talk today. And uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, the last thoughts that uh, uh, John gives, I, I really agree that uh, uh, even though we have many laboratory and mesocosm experiments, but those conditions cannot uh, present uh, the real field conditions, right? And uh, and even though we have uh, advanced uh, like you know, knowledge on the modeling part in recent years, but those models are need some um, uh, data to to validate, right? Um, so, yeah, I think recently that uh, you know MPRI uh, did a great work trying to uh, to do a field study. I think uh, it will provide many inf you know important information. Uh, for advanced science in uh, in the oil spill field, yeah, and really appreciate uh, you know uh, all the great work you did all these years <laughs> uh, in advanced um, uh, oil spill knowledge. Um, I think um, you know we already have uh, you know several questions uh, came up, so uh, let's go over. Uh, the questions all together, unless you have uh, other uh, comment. Okay, uh, so I have a question to Professor uh, Sokolowski. In the BP oil spill, which process was more dominant for live oil transport? Uh, for example, rise velocity, the degassing due to uh, oversaturation, or the dissolution of gas into ambient waters? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so what this question is referring to is when a, a live oil droplet or gas bubble, so I think this is about the oil. So the oil at uh, deep water pressure and release temperature of the deep water horizon, a lot of methane, ethane, propane, and other light compounds were dissolved into the oil 
as the oil droplet rises, the pressure goes down. And so then the equilibrium state could change. Uh, just like when you open a can of Coke, you start to release the pressure inside the can uh, and the, the amount of carbon dioxide in the headspace, you start to get the formation of bubbles. So this uh, question is asking whether the formation of bubbles in the gas, I mean, in the oil, which would then make the oil drop it lighter, is more important than the dissolution of gas into the ocean water column. So in, in our modeling, we considered both processes uh, as occurring. And in our models, the dissolution was almost always faster until the last about 50 meters of rise at the very near the ocean surface. Sometimes some gas would form on the oil droplets. There is a, a nice study by Pesh et al. where they did laboratory experiments and then a study by Gross, I think 2021, I believe environmental science and technology, but I, you can see the reference in the report where we modeled the laboratory data that they did and showed that in, all, in most cases of a blowout, the dissolution will beat the formation of gas bubbles. Um, so that's what our research tends to show. And our models that use that do show that agree pretty well with the well, agree well with the available data for the budgets of how much gas ended up where. So I would say that almost always dissolution is more important than gas bubble formation. And Dr. Bufado, uh, no, sorry, Dr. Zakolovsky, um so when the gas came, uh, the oil uh, came out of the the, the well, uh, it, it did separate into oil and gas, right? Gas bubbles. Right. There's like still gas. There's mm -hmm. still gas that's not dissolved in the oil um, at the release. Uh, it was about, I mean, roughly one to one. Uh, it's so close to one to one. I always forget which one by mass or volume had the greater share, the, the gas phase or the liquid phase. But then once you form a liquid oil droplet, this question is asking, because there's gas in there, as it goes up, is the gas going to come out, form gas, and then make the bubble lighter, or the droplet, I keep saying bubble, or mm -hmm. not? And our model says it won't, the gas won't come out into the gas phase, it will dissolve into the ocean. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Next question, Professor Fenton, <clears throat> does chemical dispersion increase uh, MOS and the MOSFA rate? Does MOS and MOSFA make oil unavailable for decomposition? We see there is some pushback on dispersion from regulators uh, world around due to sinking of oil. Okay, let's take these. Uh one question at a time. And I invite my colleagues, uh, Scott and Barron to uh, weigh in on this as well and make comments. But let me just say first, uh, do chemical dispersants increase marine oil, snow and marine oil, snow flocculation rates? The answer to that, I think is not quite clear yet in the sense of the fact that we know that uh, first of all, we need to know which dispersant we're dealing with. And then secondly, we need to know, and, and very importantly, which oil we're dealing with, okay? And so the, the answer is yet to be confirmed unequivocally, the more experiments that need to be done, at least as I see the situation. And we made those recommendations in the report. Uh, number two, does marine oil snow and marine oil flocculation, et cetera, make oil unavailable for decomposition? I would say the general sense that I get from the literature and what we've talked about in the report is no, because microbes in many respects are integral parts of marine oil snow and marine oil. And, and so when they get involved in that, they contribute to the whole issue of the snow and flocculation events. 
and certainly has been pushed back on dispersants from regulators around the world due to sinking of oil. Uh, again, I would say that that is due to the issue of uh, rather we should say that it's important to understand which oil we're dealing with, number one, which dispersant, number two. And more importantly, I think it's pretty clear uh, that there is a process which we which is discussed uh, very carefully uh, in chapter four about responses to oil spills that uh, takes into account all of the different things that need to be looked at when you try to decide what do you do in response to an oil spill. <clears throat> and I would refer people back to an excellent uh, presentation of that chapter four, which is recorded uh, in this seminar uh, webinar series and was presented by uh, Dr. Victoria Broche. Uh, Scott, Baron. Yeah, I just want to add a few things about the marine oil snow uh, and dispersants. Because as uh, John mentions, this is a complex chemistry and marine oil snow contains particles that are active. Uh, and lie of some of them, or some of them are particles. Um, it's very difficult. The chemistry is very complex. And also there's the drifting process. Marine oil snow drifts and it doesn't uh, stay, you know, some of the uh, particles that form. It makes it very complicated in terms of uh, uh, biological interactions. As John highlighted here, it's very complex. We don't really understand some of these complex processes yet. Yeah, Scott, and John, yeah. yeah, John, I think you did a great job. Um, I always remind people that the oil spill event itself is bad. We didn't want that to happen. And so we're responding as best we can to a negative event. And so some response strategies may appear to have negative outcomes, but you also have to look at if you do nothing, will the outcome be worse? Because the event that has happened is already not something we want. Um, and typically our first response option is to try to collect the oil. Once you can't collect it, dispersants are trying to make it as low toxicity as possible by dispersing it in the environment. But we don't disperse oil that we could collect, generally speaking. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And also, um, so we don't uh, put the dispersion when it's uh, not effective, right? There are protocols uh, during our spill response, like when uh, can you put a dispersion uh, when it's a research surface? Uh, you know, if it's uh, past the, the time window that uh, dispersion won't be effective, then, you know, we will not use dispersion on the surface. Yeah. And and dispersion use uh, during deep water horizon is the first time we inject uh, uh, using like a subsea uh, injection, a dispersion injection, right? And uh, during that time, uh, the main goal is to prevent, like, you know, safety concerns uh, for the people who are working on the surface so we can uh, prevent the oil reaching to the surface, so the you know the the crews uh, on those um, boats uh, trying to stop the the blowout can safely uh, uh, work on the surface. So that's kind of the main main goal when we do uh, subsea dispersion injection. Yeah. And just following on those uh, most of our questions, uh, I'm just wondering if there are some estimate of exactly what's the percentage of um, oil end up in the most uh, is there this kind of report or that's kind of too complicated i haven't followed up on that um, do you know john scott and baron <laughs> Probably, I, I yeah. do know that our chapter is 
Our chapter is focused on the processes and the okay. chapter three has to do with the inputs and would have included more of the budget type analysis. So I would mm -hmm. look in chapter three, I believe, is it right that chapter three hasn't been presented yet? It's coming or what no. was it? <clears throat> no, chapter three was. Oh, it was. was okay. I missed that one. Yeah. Sorry. Unf unfortunately, oh. we couldn't uh, get one of our colleagues involved. And so. Uh, at that time, so I pinch hit and uh, did yeah. what is oil and then inputs. Uh, but Good. in response to the MOSFET situation and what the uh, uh, what the total amount is, uh, it's a very uh, challenging uh, sampling and and measurement question because you have some marine oil flocculent material which is rising until perhaps it gets a, a few more uh, mineral particles in it and then it starts to sink again okay. mm -hmm. and then you have other marine oil snow which is polymerizing because of its interaction with microbes and then it's uh, gathering other materials together so it's not like we're dealing with uh, let's say a single species of organism or a single chemical or even three species and three chemicals. It's a dynamic interaction. And I think there've been advances in understanding what's going on, <clears throat> but it's uh, it would be akin to uh, getting uh, underwater camera systems on autonom autonomous vehicles that they can give us a uh, an accurate measurement of what is marine snow and marine oil snow in the water column and then combining that together perhaps with uh, some type of uh, particle interceptor traps that get material that's sinking through the water column and being able to measure that the question then is if you get the particles in the sediment traps as some of us have experience not in oil but in in other areas just looking at natural sinking particles uh, how do you preserve those particles in a way that gives you all the information that you want yeah yeah i, I figured it's a very complicated uh, process but we're making progress though that's what's yeah. good yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly uh, so next question, wonderful summary of the chapter with an eye towards the highlights. A reminder to all this chapter is over a hundred pages and details are found within is worth the read. The authors of this chapter uh, spend much time discussing and distilling the data into an understandable language. It is certainly worth the read if this is your area of study. Uh, this is uh, mainly a comment. Attendees are encouraged to refer to the report for greater details and background. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I think that's uh, all the question we have right now. And um, any further thoughts, uh, comments? I just want to add that this chapter, as we were working on it, uh, quite a few of us, uh, not just three of us, there was a big team of us working on the fates because of the scope, the wide scope of the chapter and the advancements made. Uh, the chapter became so big that some of the material uh, ended up being placed in the uh, appendix. There are several appendices that are spin-off of this chapter that goes into a lot more detail than we could present here. Um, John uh, was mentioning earlier that just the biology, biological aspects is just one webinar topic uh, itself. Uh, so this is a big area. There's We learned a lot, but there's still much to be learned. Yeah, I would add also that even though there were working groups uh, that worked on these, uh, there were meetings of the entire uh, committee by by Zoom. We, you know, this whole report was done by Zoom meetings uh, because of the timing and the, and the COVID situation. Um, and so even though we refer to working groups, we need to be clear in, in our understanding and everybody else's understanding that the entire committee signed off on 
each of the chapters. And we had lots of discussions, not only with, with little working groups or larger working groups, but with the whole committee. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, I think there are still some people um, kind of around. So just to let you know that, uh, you know, our uh, next month's uh, topic is about the environmental effects of oil uh, in the sea. Uh, the speaker, the guest speakers are Dr. Kerry Mitchmore and Dr. Jeffrey Short. So, uh, and welcome you to join for our next next session as well. And thank you so much for our uh, today's uh, great speakers. And all right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.